first piece of code. Can you parse it? Oh, I could write a parser for that in like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I can pass the shit out of that. <laughs> well, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you how the compiler, the Haskell compiler parses it. It says A is a function, it's a function call. B, C, and D are arguments of this function. Okay? So this kind of syntax is totally alien to imperative programmers. And of course, I mean, nobody writes Haskell code like this. They, they have more meaningful names for, for stuff. But, but, but this is, if you see code like this, you have to learn to interpret this this way, okay? The first thing on the left is a function. All the rest are arguments. Okay? In any context, if you see ABCD or XYZ or something like this, it's always the first thing is a function, the rest are arguments. I know this is kind of weird to get used to it, but this is one of the most important things to learn about how to parse code in Haskell. Okay? So why? Let me explain why, because this seems like, why, why would anybody come up with, with, with this weird syntax? Shouldn't it be A, paren, B, comma, C, comma, D? Wouldn't that be uh, the more natural way of writing this? Now you see that A is a function and takes B, C, and D as arguments, right? It's a function call. Oh, that's much easier, right? But look at the redundancy of this notation compared to this. Why, why do you need these parentheses? Why do you need the commas? Right? If you have spaces here. You don't need that. Now the thing is that um, you know Haskell is, is a functional programming language, which means functions are the most important thing the most common thing. So just like uh, in any encoding scheme, if you have something that repeats, is repeated over and over and over again, right, you use minimal syntax for it. Like in, in Morse code, E, the most common letter, is just a dot, the smallest element, dot, right? So functions are so ubiquitous in functional programming then they, they chose to use the simplest possible syntax for it. It gets some... It, you have to you get used to it but once, once you like once you start appreciating the simplicity of this form it just becomes second nature. Okay? So remember, okay, spaces. Sometimes they're not even spaces. I mean, you, you, if you if you like have to put the parentheses around B, let's say, then then you don't have the space even. It's enough that the parser know that there is a break, some kind of break between this and this, right? But let's call it spaces, okay? Space, let's think of space as an operator. The space that's put here and here and here that actually separates things. First of all, it's a very strong binding. I mean, if, if, you, if you put anything on the outside here, like, you know, plus one, seven, minus, blah, 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 and so on, this is bound the strongest. This is the strong function application is the strongest binding in Haskell. Which is again weirdness, right? Because this is invisible, this space, white space, right? Invisible stuff. Uh, and yet it binds the strongest of the whole universe. That's the that's the gravitational force here. 
No, gravitational force is the sweetest, right? So, yeah, strong force. Okay. Well, normally we wouldn't call it A, we would at least call it F, right? Or G. So functions are usually have names. Functions usually have more elaborate names. Now, another very important thing is functions are always lowercase. Now, in Haskell, lowercase, uppercase things are different. They are sort of form separate sublanguages. Lowercase things are used for functions. Um, and that includes variables. Okay. There are no variables in Haskell, so you can think of them as nullary functions, functions that take no arguments and produce a value. Right? Um, <coughs> capital letters are used in uh, type language, where you describe types. Types, always names of types are capital letters, and names of type constructors are capitalized, and so on. So you know that they are talking about types, when you see a capital, start, something starting with a capital letter, or about times. So like you have the uh, lowercase part of the language, and you have the uppercase part of the language, and they describe different things. And that makes the uh, writing a parser in Haskell, uh, parsing Haskell language so much easier. Okay. So let's write some code, something that would actually run. And, and you will see immediately that this is uh, um, a mixture of several languages. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to see at least <laughs> three languages, sub-languages of Haskell. Uh, in one single program. And it's very important because a single, the simplest non-trivial program in Haskell usually contains all of this stuff. So if, if you want to start programming in Haskell, even the simplest thing will require these things. That, so that's more like a hello world program in, in Haskell. Um, so let's, let's define a function. It's a functional language. Let's define a function um, that calculates the square of distance between a point and the origin. Let me call it. So I have to start with a, with a lowercase letter because names of functions start with lowercase. So it will be sq dist. Now you. If you want, you can open a file, call it, let's say, main.hs. If you have Haskell installed, you can just open a file with, a, with an extension hs and start writing this code. Yes? Yeah. So that's the name of the function. I'm defining a function now. Now, uh, this function will take two arguments, x and y. Okay, see the spaces between here? Yeah? Well, you don't see anything, it's just white. Right? <laughs> but, but that's a function name, these are the arguments. Just as before, I was showing you a function call, function name, and actual parameters. Right? This, this is the argument. Now, the, the main part of a function definition is the equal sign. Okay, so this is equal to, and now the definition. So the definition of a function has to be an expression, right? So of course, what do we want? We want to square the x and square the y and add them, right? That's the distance from the origin. So how do we square things? Okay, you, you can write x times x if you want, or you can time uh, you can type x to the power of 2. Same thing. Plus y to the power of 2. Okay, that's a power. 2 plus 
So for, for those people who've seen Haskell, this is like a trivial thing, right? But for the, for the beginners, this is like, I don't know. Uh, it's also sort of trivial, except maybe that you would want to put parentheses and commas in here, and you don't. Right? So, <laughs> so let's write main. Main. And main is, is also um, a definition of a function, sort of, because main does not, does not take arguments. Okay, so it's really main equals. So it's, it, main is not really a function in the sense that it doesn't take argument, but it is an expression. So it's, or, or you can think of it as nullary function, function that takes no arguments. And it's fine. So, here we want to call this function and display the result. Okay? So to display, uh, this, this will calculate numbers, so we want to display a number, right? Okay, so in, in, in the, there's a generic uh, function called print in the library that will just convert anything that's convertible to a string and print it. And being convertible to a string is a very well-defined thing in Haskell, and we'll get to it maybe in the future uh, lesson. But we have print, okay? I'm following okay. Yes. Now here we want to print the result of the call to square distance with some two numbers. Okay. Uh, so if I wrote here naively, sq dist, at, uh, say uh, three four. How would you parse it? I told you how, how to parse things that have spaces. Right, so, so print, print is a function that takes three arguments, yes. one of which is a function. One of which is a function, okay? It's a perfectly le legitimate thing to take a function as an argument in Haskell because it's a functional language, right? Um, except that if you look at the definition of print, it takes only one argument. Takes, in this case, we want to pass it a number, right? So in this case, we do have to put parentheses. We have to put parentheses, parentheses right here, okay? So parentheses make the compiler use correct precedence. So it will first calculate the stuff in parentheses, which is a function call to the function sqdist with two uh, values, three and four. So we'll pass three and four to sqdist, right? We'll call this function with three and four. We'll square three, square four, add them up, and we'll get 25, right? okay. so, so by equational reasoning, you mean anywhere that this expression appears, the other expression may appear with the values for x and y substituted in. Exactly, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about it even. Yeah. Okay. No, actually, I can talk it, about it right now. Right. It's a good point. Yeah, it's a, it's a good place to, to talk about this. Okay, so equational reasoning means you can inline stuff, right? So inlining is, is there is a little trick to inlining, right? So you look, okay, sqdist. sqdist is this thing. But it takes formal parameters, x and y. And here I'm passing 3 and 4. So I can replace sq this 3, 4 with this thing where I replace x and y with 3 and 4. Right? So that's, that's the, what is it called, beta conversion? Or some kind of. They, they call these conversions using Greek letters, and they just don't. Eta, eta conversion, sorry. Yeah, eta conversion, yeah. conversion when you rename a var variable. Substitution. Yeah, okay. So instead of sq this 3, three 4, I can put the right hand side of this equation, which is x square, and x is replaced by 3, so 3 square plus 
four square. This is called seed substitution. <laughs> 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 Yeah. This is this is just lambda calculus. This is like a basics of lambda calculus, but it's it's really understandable, right? I mean, you call this function with these arguments, so you can replace it with the right hand side with the expression. Every function is equal to some expression. Okay, so this is the expression, but you have to do the. the I think now it's a beta conversion when you re rename. Things. Yes, reduction. What are your reduction? About yeah. Okay, okay. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter what they call it, right? Down variables. <laughs> they they have names for, for these things. But but it's pretty obvious what you have to do, right? So if actually if I had, you know, like print sq this plus sq this seven eight, you know. Then I could substitute this here, and I could substitute, you know, seven square plus eight square here, and it will be fine, right? Because it sort of works like a macro, you know. But what? But what the problem is with macros? You, you, I mean, if you programmed ever in, in C, you know what the problem is with macros, right? They do this mindless substitution and. Um, uh, and uh, if, if a macro has side effects and you do the twice second replacement, you get twice the side effect. Yeah. Screw it. So, so this, this is just to illustrate this equational reasoning where you can actually simplify things. Well, this is not really simplifying them. Reason about them. But you can reason about them. You can like perform operations. Oh, so I have this, so let me do the arithmetics and then maybe un, um, unpack this again into a function call and so forth. <coughs> we'll see more examples of this at some point. I think in the book we'll find. Okay, so, so do you have this file? Okay. So he just wrote this stuff. Okay, now. There is a, an interactive environment for Haskell, the, the REPL for Haskell. It's called GCI, right? Okay, so why don't you run GCI and, and we'll see a few uh, few commands in GCI. Okay? Okay, you're blocking. <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> the most important part. Um, so the first thing is uh, you can load a file into the interactive environment and to load a file use colon L. Right? Colon L main HS. This is the file that, that you are loading. Okay? And it immediately compiles it and, and says, okay, fine. Uh, if it says if it doesn't show you any errors, it means the file actually compiled. No compilation error. At the moment of loading, it's immediately compiled. Okay, so, so we have the file compiled. Now, we can run it immediately by calling a function main, right? Well, it's not a function really, just evaluating the expression main. It gives you 25, as we expected. I don't know, did you do the mental calculation? <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the result of previous sessions. Um, okay, now there's another interesting thing that you can do is you can ask the compiler about types. Okay, don't do it yet. Okay, um, because maybe you, you've heard uh, that Haskell is a strongly typed language, right? And this program has contains no types, right? What's the type of main? What's the type of print? What's the type of X? What's the type of Y? No idea. So how can this be? We, we didn't specify any types. And um, in a strongly typed language. OK. And, and one of the main reasons why people are against strongly typed languages is they say, 
because you have to write these extremely complicated type signatures and it's really a pain in the ass. It's a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what Haskell does is the smart thing. It figures out types. Only if it cannot figure types out for you, it will say, I don't know what, the, what type you meant. And it's reasonably rare that the Haskell cannot. And yes. it gives you a relatively easy way to determine what the types are of, say, functions that you define. Exactly. Type signatures off of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's find out what is the type of SQDist. So colon T, SQDist. Okay, now this is complicated, right? This is where the first shock comes to somebody who starts learning. What the heck is this? Well, so one easy part to understand, and maybe I should write it down for the camera, is, okay, and I'll be writing it uh, partially first. So SQ distance is of the type, and is of the type is this double column. A double colon means the type of this is the following. And one part of it is, it says, it's A, arrow, A, arrow, A. Okay, what's A? Anything. Anything, right? So, so A is, is actually what's called a type variable. It means that's an X, right? It's a variable. but it's a variable in the type language. So here we are going into the type language, and in type language we have variables, now we have concrete types, and we have variables. And this says that, you know, this is like a type variable, so maybe it's like an int, 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 or double, 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 uh, or maybe string, string, string. Oh, wait a moment. Will it work with string, string, string? Uh, what's a string squared? What's addition of strings? That won't work, right? Mm -mm. So it cannot be a string. Could be an integer though, right? You can square an integer. Could be a double, right? You can square a double. Okay, so this cannot be like an arbitrary type here. So it's, it's like, think about templates in C++, right? This is an argument to a template. I'm defining sqdist for any type. And so I use the template argument A, okay? And uh, actually, what would happen is the compiler um, in C++ would not complain. Whereas, here, the compiler would actually complain if you did this. Because it knows that there are many types for which the square is not defined. Okay, these, these are bad types. Okay. So it has to <coughs> insert something in here that says, A is an arbitrary type, but it has to support square and it has to support plus. And there is a name for this family of types, and it's called num, right? So it says num a arrow, double arrow, a. So you read this, okay, for any type a that's in the family um, num, or actually class, we call it class, <laughs> class num, which means A has to support things like multiplication and addition right, and subtraction. Uh, the signature of this function is A, A, A. Okay? Now, what does this mean, these two arrows? So, in general, an arrow means uh, uh, a, a function type. Right? So, like, if, if you have A, B, that's a function type from type A to type B. Right? But, but here we have these two arrows, one after another. Okay? So the, the 
Uh, simplest way of understanding it without getting into currying is to say you read this as SQ this is a function that takes two arguments of type A and another of type A and returns an A. So this is like using this rule engine to understand the language. That's just the rule. The rule is if you have multiple arrows <coughs> then all of them uh, are separating arguments and the last thing after all the arrows is the return type. So here it, it kind of makes sense. X is of type A, Y is of type A, and what it returns is also of type A. Right? After multiplying and, and adding, you still get type A. So for instance, it could be an integer, it could be a double, uh, but it couldn't be a string. Why not? Because string is not number does not support these things. And somewhere else in the library, somebody actually defined what num is and what operations it supports. And somebody also specified that double and integer and int, they're separate types, are of type uh, no, of class. Okay? So you don't have to immediately understand this. Yeah, but you have questions already. Well, I just want to share. Um, I saw a video by, by Matt. By mm -hmm. Matt um, um, talks about type classes, and he says that that's where the reusability really comes from. So, as soon as you define these operations, squaring or adding mm -hmm. or whatever, then the compiler will go and figure out. You will know, paste in the definitions, um, so it's easy to add behaviors to classes. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is do the def write the definitions. Questions: so Is no commutativity of class expressed anyway? The documents which the size of the class. Okay, so this question is is is, is commutativity of class expressed in Haskell and uh, no it's uh, not it, it's not it's so why is it why is plus commuted there it's not for doubles I think it's some operations doubles. are not well, well, uh, to the rules break down like, yeah. Yeah. so we yeah. don't actually want to have that rule in general mm -hmm. so plus so doesn't have to be yes <laughs> well, that, that, that's actually a good question, but it's about type classes. Type classes have a lot of stuff. Like, in, right. in type classes, you define certain behaviors, right? <clears throat> and and often there are certain behaviors outside uh, of a type class that are called axioms. Sometimes that um, are left to the user. That are kind of not expressible in Haskell. They are left to the user, and usually there is a comment like. This must be uh, commutative, but we cannot express it. In okay, but let's let's forget about this. This is too complicated for us. We're crying out loud. Let's just tell the compiler, hey, we really are interested in in doubles only. Okay, double arrow, double. Arrow, double. Okay, let's not complicate our lives with an arbitrary type, polymorphic, because that would mean that square dist is polymorphic. It can uh, accept x and y as integers, ints, doubles, and so on. Right. So you can you can uh, edit the, the file. Yeah. This is there. So it's yeah. And and just so in. You, you can uh, provide the type signature explicitly in Haskell, right? And in fact, a lot of programmers in Haskell will provide <coughs> explicit type signatures, and sometimes they do it by just asking the environment to say, what type is it really? And we'll tell you the type, and you just paste it in, in here. 
right? Or, or sometimes you will modify it to, to simplify it. Um, um, does it make any difference? Uh, it makes a slight difference in performance because if you have a polymorphic function, that means that really you have to provide, the, the compiler has to pass a V table because you have, you have a polymorphic square and plus that works differently on doubles and differently of integers, right? So there is a polymorphism. Now, notice double capital letter. All types start with capital letter. But you've seen I wrote A there as, as a type variable. And it was lowercase, okay? Type variables are lowercase. So there is a bunch of rules that you know you have to remember. But that, that's, that's great. That's what we programmers love, you know, have lots of rules and exceptions to these rules. So, <laughs> yeah, so lowercase function, uppercase types, lowercase type variables. Just a bunch of things to memorize. Um, okay. Um, so, Actually, yeah. I added the double, double, double type annotation. And uh, this is colon reload. I don't know what the abbreviation is. I, I, I think R. it's just R. Just R by itself. It's a colon R. R. Reload. Yeah. Uh, current loading module. Yeah. The type. Uh, yeah, so JCI commands that, that are uh, important here. Uh, colon L and file name. Let's load a file. Colon R, reload. So if you modify the file outside of JCI, you want to reload it into this. Uh, you don't have to pass any argument to it. Uh, colon T, followed by an expression, <coughs> will give you the type of the expression. Um, anything else that we need? Well, col colon, Q. colon Q, colon Q is very important because otherwise you will never exit this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great. Colon I. In colon I, we haven't used it yet, right? But that's info. That gives you more information about the data type. There's a type there. So, uh, okay, can you ask it what type name is? Is it a question to get a Yeah. Oh. The question is, is, is that double different from num? Um, is it different from what? Num. From num? Yeah. Okay. So, num, num is a class of types. Specific types, right? Mm. Double is just one of these types that belong to this class. It's a fixed type, you know. There is there is type double. There is a type in. Also capital letter. That's a type uh, of a fixed size integer. And there is also an, an interesting type integer that is an integral type but of infinite precision, which you might sometimes use. If you want to calculate a factorial of a huge number, you probably want to use integer. So you want to type main, right? Type main, yeah. Let's see what type main is. There you go. Aha! What is that? Okay. So main always has this type. Always. And if you write main that contains some other type, produces some other type, like, uh, then you try main, define main as, uh, in the file, as true. Make, make this a comment, so show how to make comments. Yeah. So we comment this line out with yeah. two minus signs. Two dashes makes something a comment. Two dashes, and the rest of the line is a comment. You want main equals true? Main equals true, yeah. And let's run it. Reload and run. No, 
of them is true of type. So no, no, true is a. Uh, need to return true. Okay, true is a constructor of a type. Uh, okay. Which is why it starts with capital letter. Yes. Yeah. So what did it say? It failed. Okay, see? Because it was expecting the type IO. That's the main main part. I mean, error, co uh, error messages in Haskell are often very hard to read. So you, know, you, will, you will need some help with that in the beginning. Uh, but, but the main thing is that IO, it says IO. Hey, main is expected to have the type IO. And it doesn't here. It has a type Boolean, right? Bool, also capital. Right? <coughs> type Bool, that's true or false, okay? So it says, no, you cannot do that. That's because main has to have a type IO. In particular, this. Okay, so you, you can undo this and, and go back to to the type. Well, so why is it choosing to call the type IO T0 rather than IO A? Well, T0 is a type variable here. It says it, as long as this uh, because because uh, IO is actually a type constructor. It takes a type as an argument, and here it says it could be IO of any type. And it's fine, right? Why, why does it choose to call it T0 rather than A? Oh, oh no, no, it, it uses T0, T1, T2, T3, and so on for its type variables. It's an automatic substitution that compilers do when writing errors. You could do that yourself instead of using A, you could use T0. Just yeah. T0 as long yeah, as the lower case, and in, in the context of types, then it means type variable. Okay. And, and the two parentheses, do those represent a, a unit type? That's a unit type, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So main is of the type IO space, bunch of parentheses, two parentheses. Yeah. So two parentheses is a very special type. So the IO is a family of types, again, that takes an argument, a type. Uh, we pass this type, and, and, and now, of course, there's an exception to the rule that I just said, that types start with capital letters, but what if a type is um, an, an operator, kind of, uh, no. So non I O is not a family of types. I O is, what is I O? Uh, it's a type constructor. Type constructor. <laughs> yeah. But, but the type constructor really types. constructs type, but really, you know, it constructs a, let's say, yeah, IO itself is a function of fun types. No, it's not a functor. It's a function of types. But, but it describes a whole bunch of, of types in one state. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not using a family. I mean, there is something called type family in Haskell, which is not this. Is. Okay, so so this is the complete program with type annotations, right? And um, and of course it compiles and runs, right? So let's check that. Out. Let's check. So normally people would not write the type signature for main, or some people do, some people don't. <laughs> Because it's kind of obvious, and the co and the compiler will will figure it out easily, right? Uh, can we also see what the type of print is? Ah, okay. So so here's another funny type. I'll I'll, I'll write it here for the posterity. <coughs> Type of print is, and now it it's, it only can take um, arguments of a special class that's called show. Show. A. So A has to be of class show, which mm, we would probably call in Java showable, right? Something that can be shown, which means it can be converted to a string. Okay, that's a simple explanation. 
So A has to be of type show, double arrow, right? There's like a precondition that defines A as a subset of all types. And, um, and it just takes A, this showable A, and produces, it's a function, it produces a, a result of type IO unit, which is exactly what we need, right? We, we take this function, we pass it something that's showable, namely a number, a double, this will produce a double, so we give it a double and it will return IO of unit, which is exactly what main is supposed to produce, IO of unit. So this is why it works. So a function that's called in main has to have this funny type. And there are a few basic functions that do this. One is print, the other is uh, put stir. Yeah. Put stir or put stir line even more common, right? And what's the signature of put stir line? Uh, put stir line is string to IO unit. Uh, single arrow. IO unit. Okay. So put stir line also produces IO unit. But it doesn't take showable, it takes string. So but, this, but if you want to write hello world, you will probably use put stir line. Yeah? But, 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 um, showable show just says that there's a function show defined which produces a string. Mm -hmm. So, uh, put stir line should operate, oh, it would operate on any type that no, supports put, show. Put stir line operates on strings. As opposed to, yeah. So, so, so you could, in principle, instead of saying print this stuff, you could say put stir line and pass it show, call show explicitly on sq dist 3, 4. So why does GHCI choose that form for Quister line and the other form for, for uh, Oh no, no, GHCI doesn't choose anything. These are library functions. They have these signatures. They are the fixed. Library, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, that's part of the I.O. library. So in main, you can only use a function that will produce I.O. So it's random that the, the people that wrote Quister line didn't define it for anything that supports show. That's well, well, no, they, they wrote print to right. support show, and this is like a special case that so, supports right, only likely, string. Likely print was implemented in terms of yeah. a put stir line. You can yeah. implement it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Line followed, yeah. Uh, this is the okay, yeah, but the, 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 let's, let's not, okay. <laughs> let's not jump. Let's, jump. Let's, let's, let's see what's a good primary. point to stop. Okay displaying a, a representation of an object for diagnostic purposes, where mm -hmm. it's for, it's for displaying strings. So a yeah, you, usually, you know, when you are displaying output, you, you probably do some more processing in order to produce a string, and then you can just put the string out using put stir line. Yeah? There's actually a bit of a convention that uh, shows, yeah. uh, actually creates valid Haskell code. Uh, this isn't always the case, but usually show and read are about Haskell code. And when you're defining your own data types, <coughs> you can uh, derive these instances. And so then you will be able to copy output into code and use that as a value. Yeah, you're supposed to be, it's supposed to be like a, yeah, you, if you show a list, you should get a, a ha Haskell source code, which would allow you to describe a identical list. But, but it's down to the library right to make sure they do it correctly, because it doesn't always run true. But this yeah. post is OK, so I, I think we can like uh, almost finish now, right?
it's almost time to finish. Yeah? Yeah. So let me give you one final example. How would we write hello world in Haskell? Well, we, we haven't seen string literals yet. <laughs> ah, right, right, good. They are the same as in C++. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> or C. Can't be single quotes. <laughs> so we would write main, right? And inside it main, we could, we have to use one of these two functions because we don't know any more functions that return IO, right? We only know print and put sterling. So, I propose that we use this one, put str line, right? Since we are printing a string, there's no need for anything else. Okay, so we would say put str line, and we would pass it a string with uh, quotation marks, hello world, and that's it. But you see, in order to get into hello world, you actually have to <laughs> learn quite a bit of syntax before before you understand. Excellently taught syntax. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So next time we'll talk about more about functions and define uh, more complicated functions. But now we have this at least this this tool that we can write any function that, like a mathematical function, right? That will calculate stuff, and then we know how to display it in main. Right? And that's all you need to just ex start experimenting. You know, you, you know how to arithmetical expressions, plus, minus, uh, square, uh, division, there's division also, which is like normal slash. You know. There are some, maybe, yeah, are there any weird things about expression syntax? Yeah, there is one one weird thing uh, is is that when you want uh, to use unary minus, like you you want to write minus one, you have to put it in parentheses in most cases, because otherwise it will be considered like if you don't put parentheses, then you say some you know some f minus one, it will interpret this. Oh, you want to subtract one from a function? Are you crazy? Right. <laughs> No, actually, Haskell will not say you're crazy. Haskell is very diplomatic about this. It will say, hmm, but I really don't know how to subtract things from functions. Could you explain to me how to subtract something from functions? And in particular, is there a num instance for functions? Could you write one for me, please? That gets people a little pissed off. <laughs> but that's the way Haskell compiler talks. All right, thank you.